Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We've still got a few folks trickling in, but we'll probably start just in a minute. Let me take a look at everybody. I can hear Jesse, but I couldn't hear Michelle when she was talking. She just said aloha. Oh, try it again. I might be muted. Aloha. Now I can hear you. Oh. Okay. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, and I'm gonna there. mute you now, Chris. Yeah. Okay, you can mute me. No, no, not you. Well, no. uh, you can mute me too. Not quite. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Well, I think um, there might be a few folks who still kind of trickle in, but we can get started today. Uh, Pari is going to be doing the uh, instruction this this afternoon. Thanks, Pari, for being <laughs> willing to do that. Yay. Uh, for folks who don't know Pari, she's been assisting and training with Steve and Michelle for a bunch of years now, and um, they've done my sister. Yeah, I've been assisting you too. Uh -uh. <laughs> 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 so yeah, how you can get going and I'll mute the rest of us here. Okay, yeah, so uh, as, as we uh, start with the meditation practice, um, just gently close your eyes and let's take a few moments to settle into a sitting posture and find a comfortable posture, a posture that holds a balance between not being too rigid, but not too loose. A posture that offers stability and strength of a great mountain. Yet, with the flexibility of a bamboo stem <clears throat> that naturally returns to a balance, an upright position a posture that expresses alertness and wakefulness, yet doesn't feel overly strained.
as you sit settling into the sitting posture and let the mind settle back into the body with a sense of arriving home And for now, just be fully aware of the whole body sitting. As you are grounded the awareness of the sitting posture, let the mind open to receive sound as it arises. Simply experience it directly. <clears throat> Notice how the sound appears and is known spontaneously and effortlessly. How it changes and disappears in the open, empty space of the mind. <clears throat> the vast field of awareness. And with this attitude of openness and receptivity, you may start to feel movements or sensations of the breath. either the sensations at the nostrils as the air enters and as it leaves the body. or the movement or sensations at the chest <clears throat> or abdomen as it rises with the in-breath what do you notice As the air starts to fill in, perhaps you can feel the abdomen starts to expand. The lifting movement, increasing pressure, stretching, and perhaps some firmness at the end of the in-breath.
then what do you notice during the out breath? Perhaps a release, a pressure, and then the firmness starts to soften, the decreasing of pressure. And the movement of the abdomen gradually dropping in. And perhaps a little bit of contraction at the end of the out breath. <clears throat> There's no need to control the breath. We just simply observe the process as it unfolds naturally. See if you can sustain the attention and interest in this wonderful physical process that keeps us alive continuously from moment to moment. You may, <clears throat> you may also notice sensations in other parts of the body. Hardness or softness, warmth, coolness or heat, tightness, perhaps some movement or vibration, <clears throat> pressure, numbness, or even pain. Notice what happened as you focus your attention on it. Does that sensation becomes more intense? or less intense? Does it shift and change? Just simply observe until it naturally subsides. or other sensations or sounds call your attention. Then we start observing it in the same way. As it arises, shift and change and vanishes.
And when thoughts or emotions appears, <clears throat> no problem. We can gently observe them as well. <clears throat> Whatever arises, there's no need to get caught up in a story. We can give it a generic name. Just like remembering or planning or commenting. Irritation, happiness or sadness. See if there's any correlating sensations in the body. With a planning mind, sometimes there can be tension or tightness in the hands or other parts of the body. And when there's happiness, perhaps the body feels light and relaxed. And just like sounds and physical sensations, thoughts and emotions too are arising and vanishing like clouds passing through the open sky of awareness. We just simply be in the flow of experiences, receiving, observing, and knowing without clinging or rejecting. We intimately experience whatever is arising in the body, in the mind, in the present moment. And we sustain the attention until it naturally subsides moment by moment, continuously. In this way, intuitive wisdom into the true nature of this body mind process gradually unfolds
Thank you, Pare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Michelle, I think you have to unmute Alina. The talk this afternoon is on <clears throat> wise discernment. The Buddha taught that a guarded mind brings happiness. And so I wanted to um, talk from a few angles about that today. Remembering that on a, on a, a fundamental level, Vipassana is about seeing into the very nature of things as they are, or more simply even, being with the nature of how things are. And the emphasis is um, a very deep ex exploration into um, often the parts of life that we're not paying attention to, the non-conceptual level of reality, um, but it includes the conceptual level. And I wanted to begin with a um, quotation from Henry David Thoreau from his wildflower writings from his journals. This is from uh, today's date, July 19th, 1851, not quite our date in terms of the year, but the same month and day, July 19th, but 1851. Um, Methinks my seasons revolve more slowly than those of nature. I am differently timed. I am contented. This rapid revolution of nature, even of nature inside me, why should it hurry me? Let a person step to the music which they hear however measured. Is it important that I should mature as soon as an apple tree? Yea, as soon as an oak. What a remarkable thing to say. Yeah, to, that um, I am so content. I am so differently timed that I am not in a hurry whatsoever. And not comparing, not comparing himself with a, the maturing time of an apple tree or the maturing time of an oak tree, just like that incredible patience of listening to his own pace, his own maturing pace. And I think it can um, shift us to an appreciation of our own spiritual journey, our own pace in this journey, and, and often how um, careful we have to be with comparing ourselves with other, other people on this journey. The Buddha said that comparing is madness, <laughs> like insane, you know. Oh, thank you. How's that? Could you hear anything I said? Should I start again? No, okay, oh, okay. So the Buddha taught that if you connect your ten our attention with the nature of how things are, and this is what's so important, the, the non-conceptual reality, that we will um, come to understand anicca, impermanence, how, how deeply, how profoundly, whatever appears, 
vanishes, that, that everything conditioned in this world will arise and pass away. And that because of this, the strength, the strength comes in, in understanding that and facing that. It's that connection with change that guards us, that protects us. And this is very important for us, I think sometimes especially in difficult times, that we remember that the protection is in the connection with how things are. It's the connection with change and that we never know what's going to happen pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, that the strength again is understanding that experience isn't dependable, but also that we, we will never know what's going to happen next. So we come to understand that this contentment uh, rests upon a kind of courage, a courage to, to be with the unknown moment by moment, that there's a rest, a deep rest in the profundity of being with the nature of how things are, of being with change, of being with not knowing what's going to happen next. There is a way, I think, that um, when we hear that the teaching is to bring our awareness to our moment by moment sixth sense door awareness, it's like um, this, this that if you pay attention to what's happening even for a few minutes without controlling the attention, that you will notice um, thought, sound, smells, taste, touch, uh, emotion, that there's this. Uh, vast change happening at our six sense doors. So accepting that, accepting that we're born into this human body, and I like to think of it as that the information that we're receiving at our eyes, the information that we're receiving at our ears, at our nose, at our mouth, in our whole body, in our mind, our thoughts, emotions, that we are not usually taught how to discern this information. This information comes non-conceptually, moment by moment, that the, when we're seeing, it's not that we see a tree initially or a body, we see color, we see light, we see shadow, we don't see the concept initially. Or when we hear, we hear vibration and we hear texture, we don't hear bird or, car, we, we have that additional concept afterwards, et cetera, with, with smell, with taste, with our fathom long body, with the sensations of warmth and coolness, temperature. We don't, we don't um, have the concept hand arise initially. It will be maybe some earth element, heaviness or softness, or maybe temperature, fire element, warmth or coolness. We might have air element, movement or, or tension or um, throbbing, tightness, and water element. We might have flowing, streaming, or a feeling of stuckness. This, this, um, vast, again, vast range of change of sensation that we call my foot or my face. Uh, the, the insight in this practice, the understanding is from connecting and the strength is coming from connecting the attention and sustaining it, as Pari was saying in the instruction, sustaining it uh, non-conceptually. And then mind, of course, that when we think of my thoughts, and if you look at them carefully, um, are they black and white? Are they in color? Are they images? Is it often for me, it's the sound of my voice thought, or the sound of somebody else's voice uh, before it really becomes a story.
this morning I had a little time to um, attempt a little gardening project where uh, in Hawaii, where I live, we have some grass called centipede grass. And this, <laughs> you know what a centipede looks like? Well, the roots of the grass grow horizontally and they grow into the um, rocks. Like if you have a little rock wall, I have a little rock wall around my herb garden. It's taken over this one area and you know, there's many projects in a garden. So I've been watching this happen, thinking, oh, any day I'm going to get to this. And it's been some months. So this morning I had a little time. And I, I have a tool that one of the yogis in our sangha, her father, invented. And it has a long wooden handle and very strong metal that, uh, with a sharp edge that I was just like whapping this and whapping it and um, kind of just getting ahead of myself with the agenda to to get it out and i started noticing my whole body was just vibrating with um, intense texture just just from that um hitting the grass and the rock like just it was incredible um feedback of connection just you know, do we pay attention to that? That yes, I could say, yeah, it took a lot of work to get the centipede grass out, but that doesn't actually describe this amazing experience. Like it's like a constellation of of vibration and texture, and um, also um, mystery. For me, it's it's hard to believe that that centipede grass can take over like that. Like that it can get in every little pore of the rock uh, and um, so quickly, it seems, in, in time. And then, of course, this vibration has lasted for hours. I still, when I was sitting with you all, I could still feel the vibration from that experience. So powerful. Um, air element earth element is it my foot is it my body or is it air and earth element coming and going by themselves and how deeply connected i feel when i understand that i'm not separate in other words from the rock or the grass or my body just moment by moment changing sensations So one aspect of this change that takes so much courage, of course, is that life is unpredictable and that um, it takes practice to learn to explore life without the conceptual overlay and to have the patience to bring the attention back to the non-conceptual. But it doesn't mean that we have to stay there for hours. We can have an awareness of change or unpredictability or courage from a few seconds of the connection with the attention um, with anything that appears in the mind or body. I hope a lot of you know the book uh, or the books of uh, Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings. And there's a character, Bilbo Baggins, that um, said to his uh, relative Frodo when he, whenever he leaves his home he said it's a dangerous business Frodo going out your door it's a dangerous business going out your door you step onto the road and if you don't keep your feet there's no knowing where you might be swept off to that's our moment to moment experience that's our practice. It's like we really don't know what's going to happen next. And if we're not connected with that, it's so hard to pay attention. It becomes so dull and um, it's like we're fogged in 
and it's not that we uh, are, expect ourselves to stay at that kind of pitch of awareness, but certainly it's important for our spiritual um, awakening to make the time to make space for this kind of um, spiritual adventure. When I was um, a little kid, we didn't go many places, but every once in a while, my mother took me to a farm on the other side of our town where there was a lot of farms. And actually later in life, my French teacher in high school, Madame Saint Maurice, um, it turned out that she brought me to her farm. And she, I remember she had buffalo and she had a little store. And I used to have to make a choice between getting a little bit of penny candy or a grab bag. And the grab bag was just a little paper bag with an elastic band around the top and you didn't know what was in it. You didn't, you never knew what you were going to get. And sometimes, you know, it didn't pan out. You wish you got the penny candy. And I would, I would stand there and I would just be having this like terror uh, and delight like just like I knew I wanted the penny candy but I couldn't I had to go I always had to go with the unknown and my sister always got the penny candy and she always like it always panned out for her that she got what she wanted but I would say I would, it's worse than the Cracker Jacks box really like you know I would open up the grab bag and sometimes it was so wonderful but often it wasn't what I wanted but I love that feeling of not knowing what I was going to get. I love that experience of not knowing what was going to happen. And that's what each moment is like. This is from the NASA astronaut, Scott Kelly. He spent almost a year at the International Space Station. For an astronaut, going outside is a dangerous undertaking that requires days of preparation. You know, we don't often think about this. These people are up on the space station and it, just to go outside, it takes days of preparation. So I appreciate that in our current predicament, the pandemic, I can step outside anytime I want. Just to stay at least six feet away from others, just to stay at least six feet away from others. But there's no spacesuit required. Yeah, it's like, wow, what a, what a way to hold opening your door and stepping outside. That we take it so for granted. So we're born into this human body. And so I was describing light coming into the eye door. There's a hole there right? There's the iris. It's black. It's a hole. And it, it's only because there's a hole that we can receive the light and the color and eventually have the concept tree. Or there's a, the holes of the ear and texture vibration comes in, right? That it's like we think that the sound is outside or the sight is outside, but actually it's touching and going in. It's very different than how our language describes it, or how our concepts describe it. It's only, um, it only can be experienced directly, not through the thought process, not through the thought process, but directly, and et cetera. Our skin, holes, holes, holes. The mind door, the heart center, for the thoughts to come through. It's like they're not ours, they're not mine. They're just coming and going by themselves. The body, earth, air, fire, water, we share it, we share it. It's constantly changing. Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj said that 
all consciousness is sharing. Hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, all consciousness is sharing. And how amazing that we miss it. We miss that. We can feel so alienated or lonely. And it's because we're not taking the time to go on that adventure, to, to, to connect again that you never know it's going to happen. You don't know what the breath is. That's just the word breath. We don't know what we're stepping down into. That would be assuming that we know what's going to happen next. So if you shift to this place where you see that seeing is um, receiving information and that hearing is receiving information, that our body sensations were receiving information and sound, a smell, taste, thought, emotion, that we're receiving information that we're usually just thinking about, not receiving directly then you can start to see that the training has been so limited, so limited to receive that, the Buddha taught to receive that information directly and discern it, discern it, so that you don't believe every thought that happens into the mind. I mean, how, how horrible would that be, right? It's the ultimate learning about Life itself, it's like thoughts are life, sound is life, uh, light is life, dark is life, right? It's like we're receiving information, but to, ah, to have the wisdom of discernment, to understand that we can't control what appears, but we can discern it. So of course the practice leads us to this freedom from oppression, the guarded mind, meaning the, the attention that's so attentive that you get to start to pick and choose which thoughts are helpful, which thoughts to act on. That's what the Buddha taught was a guarded mind brings happiness. And, uh, and so often, um, we miss it. It's like maybe we have the thought, oh, it's time for lunch. It's like that's um, a very important thought most of the time. And then not only will it help us take action that will take care of us, but it will also, we can start the journey to wherever we will get lunch out of great compassion for ourselves. So not only are we discerning just that one thought, right? We discern if that's a helpful thought, but also we can um, decide to take action, that we can have an intention to care about ourselves and to feed ourselves out of great compassion. So this shifts our whole um, life from the knee jerk, you know, the Pavlov's dog, the knee jerk reaction to maybe we didn't even hardly pay attention to that thought, but we're at the refrigerator and we're opening the door of the refrigerator, but we haven't even really gotten what's going on, right? And how can we have compassion? And then when we're feeding, when we're actually receiving the food and tasting, swallowing, taking the time to receive it, maybe we can feel full. Maybe we can feel satisfied. Again, that's the, that's the um, guarded mind brings happiness. It's like a taking the time to share. Because of course that food is earth, air, fire, and water. Our body is made up of food. And so here we are all sharing, all consciousness is sharing. And of course, I described discerning thought in a, a very simple way, um, but often we're discerning um, maybe <laughs> 
how do we relate to the news, right? So there might be a simple thought, but then there's like a barrage of thoughts. And do we take the time and um, regulate it enough so that it can lead us again to maybe some compassion for the pain in the world? Or do we get overwhelmed by the suffering in the world? And, and it's like, it's again, that the spiritual journey, that sense again of Bilbo Baggins, maybe taking a step out and getting the newspaper in the old days, rather than on a, a iPhone, but however we receive it, are we regulating? Are we, is the mind guarded? And can that lead to, a contentment and happiness rather than an overwhelm of, of conceptual information without um, taking the time to take a little bit. And it doesn't mean that we might not even connect, like if the attention connects to the pain, and we might feel like we're starting to drown or feel helpless. It's like we might connect with the helplessness in the face of the pain or the overwhelm. Again, the Buddha taught that that's a good thing. It's a positive step toward recognizing that we often feel helpless and overwhelmed in the face of pain. It could be within our body or our friend's body, the natural, just natural, um, kinds of pains in the body or the pains of aging or sickness. So this doesn't mean the news, but it means that whatever sense door we're receiving information from, we're not trying to get rid of the pain. We're trying to connect, but regulate how we're receiving it so that we can maybe go through the journey of connecting, maybe even drowning in grief or feeling the sadness, but also remembering that we can discern that grief by receiving the physical sensations, the thoughts coming and going, and transform it to caring about the pain in the world. And this, this, this just doesn't happen overnight. It takes great practice. You know, we, we might wipe out thousands of times with the news until we remember, oh, I could approach this as a compassion practice versus, you know, getting, you know, overwhelmed and furious and hopeless and despair again and again. It's like, how do we regulate it so that we feel that? It's not, you're not trying to get rid of hopelessness. I always say, if I read a little bit, I'll be, I'll feel, well, of course I feel hopeless in the face of this. This is crazy. We live in crazy times. But then if it gets intense, I feel compassion for the hopelessness. I care about it, knowing that I'm sharing this with many, many beings understanding that this is not an, an individual alone um, situation. So you can see I'm saying that we're guarding the mind, whether it's conceptual or non-conceptual, but we receive the um, intuitive wisdom from the non-conceptual. And we, we receive the information that if we're starting to drown or feel overwhelmed, with the pain in the world, whether it's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, that we, we're really careful to start to get, oh, this can be my compassion practice. I guess I would say that um, we couldn't pick a better time to live, to cultivate compassion caring for the pain in the world. And remembering that caring about the pain in the world is pleasant, it feels wonderful. And it comes again from that wise discernment, the wise regulation. And it's strengthening, it's strengthening if you take 
a dose that you start learning how to do it. And this, it doesn't have to be, um, I'm mentioning how to work with pain, but I, I wanted to describe an experience I had maybe five or six years ago. Um, I live in, on the big island of Hawaii and about maybe 35 minutes or 40 minutes from my house, there's a, a farmer's, a little farm stand that's open Tuesday afternoons. And um, most weeks I go there Tuesday afternoon. And there's a certain place where you go on a back road. Uh, and uh, three Tuesdays in a row, only three Tuesdays in a row, about 60 years ago, this happened. Uh, and it had such an impact, I wanted to share it with you. So you're driving along this road and there's um, horses and sheep and uh, some beautiful farms. And then right before you get to the, uh, farm stand there's a little stand that's where the people sell eggs and they often run out if you don't get there early which I don't usually get there early enough but so there's this kind of anticipation of are there going to be any eggs but the big thing is that six years ago there was a huge bowl of guacamole and a huge bowl of chips for free in this little stand. I mean, can you believe it? For free, like huge bowl. You could eat as much as you wanted and there'd be plenty for whoever else was coming later that afternoon. And it was so, it was just like the grab bag to me. It was like so thrilling. I, I don't know what it is about these situations, but, um, and so this happened three times and it's never happened again. And it was boom, 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 just so exciting. And then I have to say that, as I'm driving up that road, and you know, the horse, the sheep, maybe there'll be eggs. It doesn't have a lot of um, impact, but, but as I get closer, I'll be like waiting and telling myself, look, it's been six years, it's not gonna be guacamole, but then there's waiting, hoping, right? <laughs> hoping, waiting, hoping, waiting, hoping, waiting, hoping, and then you get there and it's like, usually not only is there no guacamole, <laughs> But there's no eggs, you know, and it's like so interesting to um, see just like that grab bag. I mean, I've had dreams of those grab bags in my, it's my whole adult life. And it's the same with the guacamole. It had such a big impact. And why? Well, because it was so pleasant. And it was so generous of these people. I mean, when I go through that whole process of waiting, hoping, waiting, hoping, and then like, it's not there. It's like, eventually, the guarded mind, right? The discernment shifts to just this immensity of gratitude that these people did that. Just, just wow. And I, I really have to say, I see, I, I mentioned this some months ago, but um, we planted some banana trees on, on the Vipassana Hawaii land on the north of the, um, this island. And uh, right when the uh, lockdown happened, these um, friends of ours had picked some of the bananas and had them out for us. We picked them up, brought them home, and it was a big box. And so um, Jesse had put, a lot of those bananas at the bottom of our driveway and um, with a sign that said free. <laughs> and there are people that still come up to me and say, thank you, I love bananas, thank you so much. It's like, you don't always realize the impact of your generosity that can be very simple but i i just like you know i remember this neighbor that i don't know well recently came up to me and he said or said you that put out those bananas my son my son picked up some of those bananas when he was out walking and it made such a big impression on him was it you like it this is interesting right that the pleasant can have such an impact for us. But underneath it, it's the um, appreciation, again, that all consciousness is sharing.
and we, we all like another way to say that is that we all share life so deeply that all of our bodies are made up of earth air fire and water not just mine or somebody else's it's like this whole earth the water the air the, earth, the thoughts the mind is made of thoughts right the emotions are body and mind all all kind of flowing around you know that can be very confusing memory anticipation Uh, so ultimately, are we grateful for our six sense doors? Are we grateful for what we're being given moment by moment and that we never, we can't control it. We can't control what the next body sensation will be, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. We can't control what the next emotion will be, sad, indifferent, neutral, uh, generous compassionate afraid like there's that range of emotion there's a range of thought there's a range of um, physical sensation taste etc it's like this constant change at the sense doors and yet this is life this is given and it's when the buddha taught that when we can discern it and keep acting more wisely with more with more kindness that we're more happy. And when we're oppressed by it and we don't see into the nature of it, we don't see clearly that we're more reactive with anger, with um, fear or attachment. We get lost and identified with it and we suffer and we often hurt others. Uh, I think I'll end with um, one more story about the gift of, of life and nature of it. Um, it seems like maybe two weeks ago, I was walking up my driveway and uh, it's so rare for me to have the time to look at the night sky. And this uh, was really clear. And the, the, the sky was so black and there were so many stars and I laid down to, to just gaze. And at first I saw constellations and uh, that's concept, right? There's the Big Dipper, there's Scorpio, there's Jupiter. I saw planets, yeah. And then it just, the, the concept vanished and it was just darkness and light. So you, there's that you go from the conceptual to the non-conceptual and receive it, yeah. The beauty of it, the, uh, the mystery of it. And then as I was getting ready to get up, I saw Scorpio, which is... Um, supposed to be a scorpion, right? But I saw a kite, this incredible kite, rather than a, a scorpion. And then there was Sagittarius next to it. And, I, and uh, rather than an archer, I saw the teapot. And I thought, oh, we, we can have this great tea party with, and a kite and Jupiter and Saturn were there. And you see, concept isn't meant to be something that you get rid of but you can be creative with it and open up into, again, that, that play and spiritual adventure. And I noticed that um, ever since that night, it's been cloudy. It's supposed to be this comet out there, but every night it's been cloudy for two weeks. And it's, I love that place where it's just like, I, I, I had this idea, oh, I'm gonna do this tomorrow night. I'm gonna do, and every night it's been cloudy since, and you just get to watch that like attachment, you know, just like, oh, just, you can't control it. And how wonderful, if we could control this, it would be worse. You see all the people trying to control it. Oh, what a mess we're in. So, um, yes. May our minds, hearts, bodies be guarded so there's enough contentment in this world.
So it's um, time for some questions. Uh, we usually have the person who hasn't done something answer the more questions. So Steve will answer the questions and then some with Jesse. So we're play it a little by ear. So if you have any questions, let us know about Thanks. the instructions, about the talk, about your practice. And maybe just as a reminder, you know, if you go to the, um, click on the participants, little thing in the bottom of your screen, a thing will pop up on the right where you can um, press a button that'll raise your hand so that we can say, we can see that you're, you wanna ask a question. Otherwise we can't kind of keep track visually of who's raising their hands. Ari, feel free to jump in too. Thank you for your talk, Michelle. Maybe some of you have talk uh, questions from your meditation experience that Pare beautifully led us into, into the body and experience of the thought realm, emotions, and sense experience. That, that's a a potent area if you have questions out of your own experience or things that arose from Michelle's talk. Feel free. Anyone who has the courage to be imperfect. Looks like Kay, is you there? Good. Yeah. Great. Hi, Kay. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask if I heard um, what Michelle or Ari said, the aiming and sustaining. We were saying like aiming, I guess, yeah. Aiming is conceptual in a way and sustaining is non-conceptual. Is that why you said, you, or am I saying it's something? Do you remember uh, in Burma, any of us talking about Vitaka, Vichara? Yeah. So they're both conceptual. They're both, both very much a part of our thinking process. Vitaka being the initial connecting awareness with say a thought formation or a sense object and the vichara is the sustaining that that sustains the aware an awareness that sustains with the experience and knows the experience from within the experience so that that pre conceptual or non conceptual awareness can know it directly so it is, we're using concepts, we're using the vitaka, vichara to, to help aim, connect, and sustain the non-conceptual awareness with experience. Out of that, there may be some thoughts, as Michelle was saying. Initially, there's just sound vibration, and we're just hope, maybe learning to sustain the awareness of that pure direct experience, sound, vibration, so that we know hearing consciousness just as it is. But then be, because we have this extra faculty of the thinking mind, then that might uh, signal or initiate a thinking process. Oh, well, that's a beautiful bird. I wonder if that's the northern, the red northern cardinal. Right, and then if it, if it continues to sing, we can actually choose to go back to just sound vibration. So Michelle was talking about a dis discernment. We can discern the conceptual, or we can return to the non-conceptual. Discern the non-conceptual, direct sound vibration, return to the conceptual. So you see how the, the connecting and sustaining 
awareness is the useful, a useful, skillful use of concepts to connect with reality in the moment. Maybe you want to elaborate, Michelle. Okay. Uh, no sound. You have to unmute. Okay. Did do you have any questions about what Steve said? No, I think um, I understand both. It goes both, and yes. yeah, discerning, whichever. That's yeah, I think way. what's so fun is that um, the more you don't try to control it, it's just you start you start discerning conceptual, non-conceptual without thinking one is more important than the other, but it takes a lot of practice to, um, with the non-conceptual, because we're good at conceptual. So that's, it's, it gets to be interesting. It's a good question. Jesse, anything to add? Good. I think there's a place, I mean, it's, it's worth looking into just like, there is a, a way that in the, in the suttas and you look at the texts and stuff, there are places where we talk and we chara are translated as like applied and sustained thought or something like that. That's so it's right. talked about as thought. And so there yes. is a way that even you'll see sometimes in the discourses, like uh, discursive thought as an aspect of we talk and we chara. But then when you're talking about like actually practice and the, and the, and the, the process by which we come to more and more concentration. It's that applied and sustained, and sustained attention that really isn't conceptual, but that is, that is, you know, applying the kind of bare observing attention. Um, so I do think that like on some level, grammatically, those words can mean of actually kind of range of, mm -hmm. of ideas. And then there's just that difference of like, are you talking about it in terms of, you know, meditation practice? or in terms of just like the sort of normal functioning of the mind. And I think that's sometimes where it's a little confusing. Uh, thank you, yeah. I actually, yeah, encountered that both ways and got confused, like you said. Thank you for mentioning that. As one gets more concentrated in, in practice, the, those functions tend to recede. The, the connecting, sustaining, we talk, we chara, recede. And then, and then practice is often dominated by that like joyous interest, you know, awe, amazement of how this mind body is just vibrating moment to moment, pulsating moment to moment. And, and so, so not so much it goes into the vitaka vichara that has thought formations around experience. They back off a bit. It's more the interest and then uh, kinds of non-sensual dhamma uh, feelings of joy and pleasure, happiness, and so forth, when we start feeling contentment and ease. Those are some of the things that we think of about when we think, well, what are the benefits of meditation, you know, aside from you know, insight, illumination? Well, along along the way, it's just, just gradual de degrees of more and more subtle ease, interest, joy, happiness, comfort, contentment. Uh, whereas we talk with Chara, they're, they're more kind of in, interactive elements of mind, as Jesse was saying. Yeah. Uh, looks like uh, Chris, you have a question? Yeah, um, I actually have two questions. I chose to stand for the meditation as uh, sometimes sitting, whether it's in a chair or kneeling or whatever hurts my back. So it went fine, but I felt a little bit like guilty that I was like ignoring the instructions about sitting and settling in. But I've also heard teachers say not to put too much fuss about that. So I just wanted to put that out as a question about standing during a meditation. And the other was, I recently read an article that talked about the health benefits of breathing in through your nose, that it's much better for your health because of uh, nitric oxide. And I've heard 
meditation teachers encourage us to breathe, you know, in through our nose, out through our mouth, in through one nostril, out through the other, all kinds of different breathing stuff. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, just those are two things that occurred to me during the meditation. So can you ref reframe your first question about standing? Is it like you're asking sure. if, is, if it's okay? Is it okay? completely okay? Or if somebody is taught giving guidance about sitting, should you be sitting? Completely okay. Completely okay to stand when we're, or sit. Walk when we're when we're giving walking instructions or you, or you choose to do walking or lay down. Particularly if your back is acting up and that's the only posture that is supportive for you to breathe and be aware. Your second question, I just don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 been doing this for a long time and I've never sort of experimented too much with breathing in any particular way. More I just try and feel what the affects and effect of breathing is on, within the body and not try to control the breath but let, just let the breathing do itself, breathe naturally. If there's any question about it then I might pause, take a couple, two or three full breaths and and then just relax again make sure there's there's um ease around the chest cavity and, and uh, as pari was instructing that that where the spine is is straight but not rigid r relaxed but not too loose and and then i find that uh the breathing has its has an intelligence the body has an intelligence of its own and uh, and the breath being also the body, it has its own intelligence and bre breathes itself. Maybe Jesse or Michelle or Pari have something to add to that. I'll just uh, adding or maybe um, make a little bit of clarification. Um, yes, as um, Stephen was saying, it's totally fine um, to stand. And um, in fact, um, the um, that's four um, main meditation postures, and all uh, legitimate um, postures uh, to practice in. There's um, sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. I think the um, the key point to remember is um, you just kind of receive whatever sensations that comes up and um, you observe it and you know what's going on. Um, as you observe um, how sensations or thoughts are shifting and changing and that's how we learn um, to discern uh, the impermanence nature of all of our experiences. Um, through this six sense doors, um, you know, all these experiences. So it doesn't matter whether you sit or you stand or you walk or even when you do your um, daily chores. Um, yes. And yeah, with the second question, um, I mean, for me, I just... <laughs> Like Sip was saying, um, I just kind of keep it simple. You know, it doesn't really matter um, how or where you um, you breathe, as long as you know the sensation that's occurring in the present moment. Um, I mean, for me, that's probably um, all we need. Um, uh, Robert has a question here, and, and Amy, Amy. You, and I'll, yeah, there's a couple more people right in front of you, so we'll uh, Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my question is about <clears throat> choice and choosing. Uh, 
Michelle talked a little about that today, but it, it's uh, occurred to me uh, not infrequently that there are essentially two times during two different situations during meditation practice where I'm not choosing things. One is when I'm deep into the concentration practice and I'm just feeling my breath and not choosing anything about it, just feeling it. And sometimes the concentration gets very strong then. And the other is when I'm doing Vipassana practice and I <clears throat> choose to approach that with uh, what's often called choiceless awareness. And when I do that, when I make that choice, most often things arise and pass away so quickly that I often don't even know what they are. Or I know it's a thought, but I don't know what the content of it is. Or I know it's a sensation, but it's gone long before I can actually identify it. However, I also sometimes choose uh, during the Vipassana practice. <clears throat> or even today during the concentration practice before I switched to Vipassana, where I noticed and went into in some more concentration into the heat and coolness of my breath. I, I use my nostrils. And, um, and then in the Vipassana practice, sometimes something comes up, <clears throat> even in choiceless awareness, and it's a little stickier and it's usually what I would call a, 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 an emotion or, or a feeling or a mind state, uh, anything from happiness to sadness, uh, fear to anger to uh, love. And I choose at that time to actually go and investigate that more than letting it just slip away. In other words, I choose to see partly where it feels in the body, partly how long it sticks around, partly perhaps trying to figure out what was the precedent to it and what comes after it. Uh, and, and I've noticed most so-called negative uh, mind states like anger, I've done that often enough to, at least at this point in my practice, to think that fear underlies uh, anger. And that's because I've made the choice sometimes to really look clearly at anger and what the con constituent parts are. Uh, and, I, and even making the choice to look at something more deeply than just to allow choiceless awareness to go on, where when I follow that for a while, it brings up the strongest feeling, knowledge of, I don't know the right words, of not self that I ever recognize in my practice. Um, and what I'm thinking is that in making all these choices, and of course, in order to live, you have to make choices all the time. But um, in making all these choices, especially during the, the formal practice, it occurs to me that I'm just building up myself by doing that. That it's just, oh, here's this guy. He's going to choose now to really look at anger. Or he's going to really choose to look at the physical sensations of and identify and investigate. In other words, to, to not allow it just to happen and pass away, which things do very rapidly, um, but to sort of choose to let them stick around. And I was wondering if I'm looking at choice or choosing in an incorrect and not helpful way. That's possible. And I think that's what's helpful, like related to Michelle's talk on discernment. And alongside of that is, um, in the Buddhist psychology, the, the term chetana is the, is the equivalent of what we talk about as, as um, willful action, uh, a, a sense of choice. But it's different than 
choosing with identification or choosing with an agenda, choosing with an attachment, choosing as if there is a chooser. Rather than the discernment that Michelle was talking about, is this helpful? Would it be helpful? And so to have the, that willful action, that quality of mind that, that gathers other mental states into a moment of action, that is thinking, speaking, or in meditation, changing your posture or redirecting your awareness, um, uh, uh, influenced by wisdom, influenced by that discernment, skillful, uh, using wise reflection for skillful action. So kind of redirecting uh, and maybe you can perhaps look at what you were saying in the beginning where you, you, you're focused on the breath to be concentrated, whereas in, in, um, in, in experience, we can actually do two things at once, G grow some calm and tranquility by focusing on the breath, but immediately start the Vipassana by noticing that there too is rapidly changing phenomena sensations appearing like in staccato, just with a single rising movement of the breath, pushing, propelling, uh, increasing pressure and so forth. And then the re reversal release of pressure, the lightness and the falling sensations and so forth. So right there, you're inviting wisdom into, and discernment into the practice and not so much dividing the practice between, okay, I'll, I'm gonna breathe now and, and get concentrated and, and then I'm gonna choose to be choicelessly aware. Maybe it's a little bit too much uh, identification mm -hmm. with picking and choosing r rather than having an understanding that all we have to do is uh, grow a little calm and tranquility and then learn how to abide in the present moment, let experience do the work. Not, not, not really think that choices awareness is a good thing to do and not really think that well maybe I should kind of somehow hold on to phenomena to investigate it more In investigating phenomena it might be when the when the a pattern of phenomena keeps arising it's not the same phenomena but it's it's as if it's the same phenomena some certain sensation group certain emotion cluster might just keep arising when we look close it's just like you said, it's the same as that vibrating, pulsating, changing sensations every moment. And, and if fear is arising, they're just little fear moments continuously arising and disappearing, continually arising, disappearing. Joy, continually arising, disappearing. So there's no, there's no way to actually hold on to it, to investigate it. It's actually, it calls for being even more relaxed and more keenly alert, more discerning, as Michelle was talking about in her talk. Can you add to that, Michelle or Jesse? Yeah, I might just, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think that it's just a, it's just an important, the most important thing is just like keep looking. Like there's very important and meaningful um, like process happening there. And don't give yourself a hard time about what's happening, just note what's happening, right? So I think the sense of like, you know, there's uh, on the more sort of technical frameworks of the tradition would say that there's volition happening at every moment, right? That, that every single moment of consciousness of any sense experience is going to have a volitional quality that that arises in the mind in regards to it, whatever moving away moving towards moving to, you know whatever whatever it might be and that that is conditional right that isn't just you doing that that there's a there's a conditioned process to that but i think the question of like where is it me that's doing this where is the movement of the mind spontaneous i think it's just something to just just watch rather than feel like you can do right or wrong so much as notice when it feels like it's me and notice when the attention simply connects with something in a way that feels more intuitive or that feels uh, not 
not effortful from a sort of self way and just notice the difference. I mean, I think the, you can get into the trap also of feeling like self is wrong and non-self is right. And so anytime the sense of self arises that therefore something wrong is happening versus just the more open perspective of like, there are conditions that are gonna lead to a, a stronger sense of identification. There are gonna be conditions that lead to less of a sense of me and mine in terms of the direction of the mind, but to pay attention to it is really important and really interesting. Just that it's like, just to, just to get that it's interesting terrain of like, oh, where is there identification? Where isn't there in terms of these, these moments where the attention moves from one thing to another? It's like, oh, did that happen because this thing arose and the mind spontaneously went to it? Or was there a volitional, more sort of identified piece with it? And that doesn't mean it's wrong, right? Sometimes we do choose to go to the breath, right? We choose to anchor. Uh, and it feels very me choosing that, right? And there's other times where the attention goes to something and it feels more spontaneous in kind of like the momentary happening way, or just you're very concentrated on something. The concentration has built and the mind is just gonna keep on its own, keep finding its way back to that as it arises. And so it's not just one thing or the other. I think there's a lot of things playing out, but to be open to just that it might be, the most important thing is just noticing what's happening oh, is there a strong sense of me or not? Noticing there's like, oh, this, that seemed to feel like it happened on its own and being very careful about the layers of judgment or um, alterations that you're trying to make versus knowing that sometimes these types of things are gonna arise, sometimes these others. Um, and I think I totally, as Steve was saying, just the, the, There is such a value in understanding the difference between concentration, pure concentration practice and various kinds of what might be considered, you know, in the realm of Vipassana practice. But there's also the ways in which we don't always need to be kind of bifurcating them and breaking them up, right? Of understanding that they're, they're often always gonna have some element. You know, even pure awareness, the pure concentration is gonna have some awareness involved in it, of some noticing of something. And so, for example, I'd say when you say you were doing concentration on, the, on the, the breathing in your nose and noticing the coolness or warmth, I would say that is not pure concentration practice. That is Vipassana practice. If you're noticing that range of sensation, you might still be getting very concentrated in noticing it, but it's, you're bringing in the Vipassana element. So you don't, you know, just that sense of like, it always doesn't need to feel as divided or as kind of mechanical and that there's times where you just notice, oh, there's a different quality to this approach. There's a different quality here. There's a different sense of me doing it than here and there and, and keep exploring because it's super interesting terrain. Yeah. Michelle, you have to unmute yourself. I think it's just such a fun question. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, we could talk a long time about it. Um, I think I'd, I would offer a, fr a phrase from the Zargadatta where he said, um, the practice is effortful until effortlessness asserts itself. And you can translate that into um, the Buddha taught perfect upaya, like perfect skillful means. And there will you will the the more you learn all these different ways to practice that are skillful means, you will choose them until they choose themselves. So eventually, like at times, skillful means will choose itself, but that's when the practice, you, you trust it when there's like a deep equanimity. You know that aversion isn't choosing it or attachment isn't choosing it. It's like skillful means are choosing it. And um, whether that's happening or not, it doesn't matter <laughs> because um, you can't control it. <laughs> So the beauty of this is that uh, you'll, see your, you'll see yourself 
choosing until you're not choosing. And uh, the, the gift in it is that you start being okay with the whole, the whole way it's unfolding. But I think there's more to say about it, but I think that that's what I would say now. Um, it is, Linda, I know just right, you just have to go, but uh, you're good. she was going to ask a question. Um, all right, take care. <laughs> all right, Linda. <laughs> uh, Eva, unload her hand. So, yeah, Amy, do you have a question? No, I don't want to hold up the, the works here to, to uh, get this um, completion for the night. I was just uh, going to make a comment about the nose, the nostril breathing, actually. I want to just thank Michelle and Stephen and, and you, uh, Jesse and Pat, all of you, every person in the squares. It just feels so nice to see everyone, to feel the, the chi and the, the love coming through the, the windows. Um, um, let's see the nose thing. I, I was going to just say in the yogic tradition that the, the idea about the nostril breathing is to warm the oxygen and to filter it. And it's very nice to think about in this pandemic with all the issues with the lungs to really, that the, that the mouth is used, we have a mouth to speak, we have a mouth to eat and to, uh, you know, occasional sneeze and cough and those things. But then they think really the nose is really in through the nose and out through the nose really helps to open the lungs a little bit more, maybe to connect in, but and then that aside, all thoughts come and go. So um, that's just a comment I thought I'd throw out there about the nostril breathing. Um, again, thank you so much, everyone. It's a point that I'll just offer, you know, that, that to really get Chris going back to the question, it's, you know, there are so many traditions are, are gonna offer different techniques and approaches and have their sort of rationale and, um, the same with with standing, you know, in the in the um, in the practice uh, during the sessions, and just know so that in this space, you're welcome to stand anyone at any point. And um, in another space, you may get hit with a stick, but that to know that like that's in this space that that's cool. And in this space, the idea is like yeah, you that there really is an, a very strong commitment to not try to control the breath, but simply observe it in whatever the most easeful state is. And I think it actually has a lot to do with Robert's question too, of just like, where is this dance between control and acceptance and uh, concentration and mindfulness? And, you know, these things are really much at the heart of, of a lot of the, um, the things we're trying to come into balance with. Yeah, Michelle, you, have, you can, you, man, you might want to move your mic back up again to your mouth. Okay. Um, just to add that, about the breath, the air is coming in our nostrils, whether we control it or not. Like the air is coming in our nostrils, whether we're paying attention to it or not. And it's coming into our lungs, whether we're paying attention to it or not. So it's very important to know that we're not, when we choose to pay attention to any part of the mind or body or anything in the universe. The idea of Vipassana is that the observation is without control. And uh, when there is less identification, less aversion and attachment, the breath will get more natural and deeper. You're not trying to make that happen, but just to know that um, the direction of the practice is with absolutely no control. But bringing in skillful means when we need it, that that's good practice. Yeah. So it's what I mean by doing nothing with full commitment is really that what I regard as the essence of, of this practice. So let's all get out there and do nothing with full commitment. Yeah, great <laughs> question. Thanks, everybody. Even what, what we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
really wonderful to see everyone again. Uh, thank you for joining us again. And um, we'll be back again next week again, for sure. And just know, you know, for some bunch of folks have had to leave already, but just if you've already registered, you don't need to register again next week. It should be the same. It'll be the same login information every Sunday. If we have to change it, we'll let you know, but you won't have to register again for the Sunday sitting. Yeah. Mm, take good care. Have a great week. <laughs> fun. <laughs> so much fun, my favorite.